Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Riverfront Red Show, a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. This is episode number 537 of the world's most dangerous podcast, where we will discuss Cincinnati Reds, and specifically, some of the greatest Reds trades of all time. And buddy, am I ever excited to uh, have a couple, a pair of fellow sophisticates on with me this week. Um, first off is a face you might recognize, a voice you definitely will down on the bottom of the screen is host of Locked On Reds, Jeff Carr. Jeff, how are you, buddy? Nate, thanks for having me, man. I'm doing pretty good. I don't know that I'm doing as good as that chair that uh, David Bell was throwing against the dugout wall the <laughs> other day, but you know, I, I'm, I'm doing all right. Hey, we appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. And a first time guest, if I'm not mistaken, is a uh, face and voice you may not be familiar with, a Twitter handle you probably are, sometimes known as West Virginia Redlegs. I got my man, Branch Brown, member of the Riverfront family, joining us. And we are pumped to talk some Reds ball with Branch. How's it going, Branch? It's going awesome. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks, man. I love you. You ain't got a lie just to butter us up, buddy, but we appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Before we get into the nitty gritty, please head over to YouTube and or your favorite podcast app, not even or, just and. and give us one of those subscribes, a like, a follow. It helps the show grow, and that's what we're trying to do. And huge, huge, huge shout out to our Patreon family, without whom we couldn't do this thing. So if you'd like to join that family, head on over to patreon.com slash riverfrontcincy and join up. We'd love to have you. All right, guys, I do this every week. We'll start with you, Branch. What's uh, How are the vibes right now? Uh, last night really made them a lot better, didn't it? Uh, it, <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was pretty it was pretty low for that win last night, to be honest with you. Like, you know, question my, my you know, fanhood and everything else, but uh, mm -hmm. that win really helped. It really did. So I'm doing better tonight. We're sitting in a tie ball game right yeah. now, so I'm doing all right right now, too. 100%. How about you, Jeff? Yeah, for once they didn't waste a great pitching performance. I was I was happy to see yes. that because this team has been pitching so freaking good to begin the season, and the the lineup's just not giving them any support. So I'm I'm happy when they can even score just enough, even if it's mm -hmm. still one of those days where you're like, all right, the lineup, hey, <laughs> do something here, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, bold strategy. The guys figured it out. I wish they had figured it out a couple of weeks ago. Just don't let the other team score runs. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been pretty bleak in Reds land. I'm certainly not giving up all the hope yet, but it has not been great. Uh, quick standings update. The Reds are dead last in the NL Central. Um, the Brewers are in first place at 28 and 20, followed by the Cubs, 27 and 22. Uh, five and a half back of the Brewers, the Pittsburgh Pirates at 23 and 26. Tied with them, the dirty St. Louis Cardinals, and then our beloved Red Legs, bringing up the rear at 20 and 28. I don't have a lot good to say about that, gentlemen. Um, it's just been the season from Hades. It seems like just about everything that's gone wrong has gone wrong, except for two things. Jeff, if I would have told you going into this season that Hunter Green is blossoming into the ace we always thought he could be, always wanted him to be. And simultaneously, Ellie De La Cruz is putting himself on the map as a potential MVP candidate. You'd probably be pretty optimistic about this season, wouldn't you? I'd say, yeah, we'd be in first place. <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, I, I can't believe that those two things are happening. Happening. And thankfully, it gives us a reason to tune in every day because, man, alive. It just, just feels, it's got the feeling of another one of those red seasons that we've had almost solely for our entire existence. But, like you said, the pitch has been great. So there's reason to, for optimism. Um, if they can turn things around, then, you know, we're going to tune in either way. So at least make it watchable for us. My question to you, Branch, is who are a couple guys that you think? Are on the verge of turning it around. Let's start with the offense. I, 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 I gotta believe that Steers is gonna turn it around. Um, he's hitting the ball hard, it's just going straight at people. And I even checked the other day, his launch angle was even better this year than it has been in the past. I don't really, I, I, it doesn't make any sense. What's happening to Steer makes no sense at all. No, nope. it's gotta change. It absolutely has to. 
I'm a little bit more leery on some of the other guys, and hopefully we'll get Flegel back sometime soon. Yeah, hopefully. Um, I will shout out Brother Jamer Candelario. Um, oh, he's yeah. been a little bit better lately. Granted, he had a long way to go from where he started this season, but he's got his OPS up over the last couple of weeks in the mid-700s where he's supposed to be. Um, if he can keep that up, it'll help. Um, I guess I'm just praying. I'm looking for anything right here to – Give us give us some hope. One guy we can be hopeful about, uh, Tyler Stevenson. Jeff, what have you seen from Tyler Stevenson that's got you fired up? Yeah, he has been killing it this season, and you kind of talk about getting unlucky. I mean, he got unlucky again on Tuesday's game, hitting the ball straight at guys, hard line drives. He is, I think at one point, and I think Shohei Otani has passed him now, but at one point he was leading the league in barrel percentage, like barrels per, you know, batted ball events. And without getting too deep into, you know, terminology that makes everybody's eyes roll back into their head, he's in the ball really hard. He's just finding the wrong spots. And I think that even with his high batting average, he could be even higher and, and his slugging percentage could be even higher than it is right now. Um, he struck out to begin uh, Wednesday night's game, unfortunately, but Overall, I mean, he has looked like the kind of guy that we expected to get last year and that we just never saw. And he's hitting the ball a lot harder than he was even in the season, you know, the 50-game the season where he, he showed us that he could slug really high, but maybe some of that was a little bit of a, a, little bit of a red herring. Uh, he's showing it's not a red herring this year. Yeah, for me, it's been the most exciting part of this season outside of the Ellie thing. Um if you listen to this podcast regular, regularly at all, we, my, Chad and myself specifically, I've been so, so high on Tyler Stevenson. I know Locked On's had a lot of those, a lot of that optimism as well. Um, but then when he came out and struggled so badly last year and to begin this year, you go back and look at his stats and you look into his minor league numbers and you start, it, it's pretty easy to find evidence of why he may not be the player that we thought he was. So the fact that he is kind of putting it together right now and those bats of ball skills are there and he's hitting the ball as hard as he is, is incredible. He's one of the been hitting the ball, one of the top hitting catchers in all of baseball. Now, oddly enough, this season, the catchers are kind of smashing the ball, but we're not going to worry about that. We only worry about the guy that we have. And that's Tyler Stevenson coming around. Now we just need all these guys to do it at the same time. Cause this is also a very pro Will Benson podcast and it has been ugly for my guy, Will Benson. Branch, what is jumping out to you when you watch him get the batter's box? He just ain't making contact. I mean, he's he's like he's like going for the fences every time, and he's got you know, good zone discipline, so he should be making contact, but he's whiffing hard. It's like he's selling out for something. Maybe he needs to ease back just a little bit. But, you know, he's, it, it's, yeah. it's ugly. It's ugly. <laughs> Yeah. Striking out so much, I didn't bother pulling up the stats. I didn't want to look at them. I'm not going yeah. to lie to you. Yeah, I'm trying to. I, think it's the, like, I live I think a happy life. I want to keep league. it that way. Yeah. So that walk, I cheered, so I cheered for him in that walk yesterday's game. When he walked yesterday. I was like, <laughs> got that walk, and he went the other way. Like yeah. there were shades yeah. of it's yeah. like, ooh, is he figuring it out? Like hopefully he can build on this because mm-hmm. man, we've been missing it. We've been missing it. He's the reason that I clamored so much for. No matter what the cost was going to be, there's always a room for it. If not Joey Votto, a Joey Votto type veteran on every major league roster, everyone that is hoping to contend, because he was he's been going through it, and whatever the antidote is, it's not been in the Reds clubhouse. Um, uh, maybe maybe it is, and it just hasn't kicked in yet. We're hoping so, because man, we love that guy, but it's not been very good so far, and. I don't know. No more negative. We're out of that. All right. So let's move on to Brother David Bell. Because I've been asking, and Jeff alluded to this earlier, if the Reds needed to shake something up. There's been a ton of discourse about whether or not David Bell should be fired. I don't have a strong opinion on that. We've been pretty lukewarm or, or luke cold on David Bell for a while. But it seems like something needs to happen. I don't know what that is. My question to you, Jeff. Was the chair the problem all along? <laughs> now that it's not, Ir- 
It's not ergonomically correct, Nate. Um, no, I'm not sure if it was the chair. Um, but he, there's something about this team, like the way that it's set up organizationally, I think it's ran through the front office. I think that there's so many different uh, brains in the trust, if it were, like the, mm. the meetings for lineup construction have to include far more people than they ever have. Um, and, you know, I've, I've heard that, you know, Jeff Pickler has a lot of put input to the lineup, you know, Joel McKeithen, obviously. And, and I think that at the end of the day, it's really hard to figure out exactly what David Bell is in total control of. Like, I feel like pitching changes are a collaborative effort between him and Derek Johnson. The lineup is a collaborative effort. The, uh, you know, all the things that he does he is the mouthpiece for, but not necessarily the guy with the finger on the button for most of the mm -hmm. stuff. So it's, it's weird in that if you kind of follow along the road of, we need a different voice, you're going to get somebody else that essentially does the same stuff. It's just, how is he going to fit in? They're not going to get a guy like Joe Madden. Joe Madden wants to run the ball club the way that he wants to run the ball club, but they're going to get somebody that fits into the system that they have already put in place. Um, the changes that I think everybody wants would have to be changes that happen in an off season, because if you do it during the season, you risk completely alienating your clubhouse from your front office and from your coaching staff because of the changes that you would have to make. So, I mean, I could see a change here or there, but I think it would almost have to be more philosophical than actually physical change to this, this team. And that's kind of the hard part for me is that I don't necessarily oppose the change of a voice. Like, I don't think that the Reds are good because of David Bell, but I have a hard time pinpointing him as the reason why they're not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. I guess where I stand on it right now is there doesn't seem to be a ton of accountability and perhaps behind the scenes there is obviously we don't know what's happening back there, but with what David Bell says in the media, and we know that he's just protecting his guys, though one could argue that maybe taking them to task might light a fire under them. I don't understand how a team that hopes to, I won't even say contend right now because we have these injuries. The injuries weren't David Bell's and the coaching staff's fault. But there are a lot of a lot of Major League Baseball players that we think are good that are pretty darn bad right now. And I don't understand how you just continue with the status quo without doing something. And I don't know if it's firing Jeff Pickler, the, the bench coach and game planning coordinator, whatever that means, or – Joel McEaton, the hitting coach. I don't have the answer. That's why they don't pay me. There's a lot of reasons why they don't pay me. But I, I can't shake the feeling that something needs to happen to let these guys know, hey, this is not okay. None of y'all are guaranteed a spot on this team. And if y'all don't get it together, and that's, that goes from the coaching staff, the front office to the coaching staff on down, somebody's get, they've got a lot of fire somehow. Branch, what do you think about all this? Who's the real David Bell? Is David Bell the guy that's throwing the chair in the dugout? Is he the one that's out there getting tossed every four or five games? Is he the one that's sticking up for his players? Or he's the guy at the press conference that's mumbling? And you can't understand what he's saying? He's like, well, we just keep – It's the worst. You know? I, I, have I we ever seen Bill anything. Belichick and David Bell in the same room yeah, together, by the way? No, no, we have not. <laughs> yeah, it's, we're not. It's, 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 it's frustrating for me because I feel we're missing out as fans. Give me the real David Bell. Give me a fiery David Bell. It's not, I'm not saying he has to be up there dissing the players. We come out there and be mad at the other team for hitting our batters and show it to us. You know, yeah. if he's making the lineup, he's making the lineup. If he ain't making the lineup, he ain't making the lineup. I know he's making any game changes. And he really, really, really loves any chance there's a chance to pitch, run, or change somebody. He will do it. He, but he also does a real good job handling the bullpen. So, you know, it's where, where are you at on that? <laughs> you know? Yeah, six to one, half dozen of the other. Did y'all ever watch yeah. that? Yeah. The old fantasy football show, the league. Yeah. Oh yeah. David Bell's a tinkerer. He can't stop. Yes, tinkering. he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> Just <laughs> leave it alone. <laughs> Put guys in the positions where they're most likely to succeed. And like for the bullpen, I feel like he really does that. And I think with a full roster, he probably does that. 
Mm-hmm. But we can also complain about Nick Crawl if we want to. Because going into this season, I was beating, banging that drum that the, this team had all the depth. They were so deep, and I believed it, buddy. I went to bed happy with my head on a pillow every night, dreaming, dreaming sweet dreams about how this team was so deep. And then you wake up and you realize you got some platoon guys, and those guys aren't useful if you have injuries. Stuart Fairchild can mash lefties and play decent defense, but when he is forced to do other things, suddenly he's not a guy you really want on a major league roster. In a perfect world, he has that spot. He only plays that role, and it's good. But we don't live in a perfect world, and we are sure as heck seen it this year. All right, real quick shout-out. I just want to shout-out Hunter Green one more time. Our guy's got a 3-2-2 ERA, a 1-33 ERA plus, 3-3-1 FIP. So not even – Killing it. Not a lot of variance. His whip, which is my favorite pitching stat, walks and hits per innings pitch, 1.159. It's beautiful, guys. And it's not even the best on the team. Because the guy who threw last night as we were recording this, Andrew Abbott, who I'm not going to lie, I I think I was lower on him than anybody else in the starting rotation going into this season. I was like, no way he can duplicate what he did. Certainly no way he can improve on it. He heard me, told me where I can stick it, and he has been shoving early on. Seven innings, no earned runs last night. Jeff, tell me how much you love Andrew Abbott. Well, you talk about a narrative that uh, aged well, wasn't it? Like before the season started, there were a few beat writers that were just like, Ooh, he could start the season in AAA. You know, he could be a Louisville guy. And like, really? Abbott? Are you serious? Like, he was the best pitcher on the team last year. And I get it, there were injuries and stuff like that, but he's showing it again this year. And it's funny because Tuesday night's line, like if you look really close at it, you're like, he pitched seven innings, allowed five base runners, and only had two strikeouts. So was he really good or was he really lucky? And he was like, no, he was really good because he's just really good at missing barrels. And that is something that mm-hmm. it feels like this starting rotation over the last few years, even at times, guys like Luis Castillo and Tyler Malley just really struggled at missing barrels. They were focused on missing bats and getting that whiff rate, getting those strikeouts, things like that. And Andrew Abbott seems to go up there, and we always ascribe the bulldog mentality to Graham Ashcraft. Andrew Abbott's a bulldog too. And I feel like we kind of underrate how much of a bulldog he is. And I know that everybody has... uh you know, conjured images of Tom Browning in their heads whenever they watch him pitch because of the way that he pitches and the way that he looks a little bit too. So the the idea that, you know, he he is not one of the best pitchers on this team is just folly. And I I think that he should be getting some recognition from more than just us Reds fans. Like he is pitching that well. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think he's on the verge of it. He was starting to get that love last year before he had a slow finish. Um, if he can maintain this anywhere close to this for the rest of this season, then I, mean, I think he's going to become a bit of a household name. Um, just looking at this rotation, Frankie Montas is the only one of our regular starters with an ERA plus below 100, and it's at 98. And I think he's going to get back there. I mean, we've got ERAs 322 for Hunter, 268, 268 for Andrew Abbott. We won't talk about his FIP. We don't like stats that don't agree with my narrative. Uh, <laughs> Graham Abbott. <laughs> <laughs> Graham Ashcraft, 425. Frankie Montas, 437. Lodolo, 3.34. Hey, speaking of that, got some good news on the Nick Lodolo front today. Saying that he uh, was put on the IL for precautionary reason, reasons and should be back soon. Um, Yeah, this, this starting rotation has been crushing. Nick Martinez has done what he's supposed to do, belongs in the bullpen as a long reliever and makes spot starts. We'll see what happens today. But if you want to believe, if you want hope, that rotation is why you can have it, why it's justified. And you say Andrew Abbott's a bulldog. People call Graham Ashcraft a bulldog. We're calling it now. Abbott is the bulldog. Graham Ashcraft is a bull in a china shop. (laughs) Because he's out there just going nuts. I like that. I like that. All right. Let's talk about this. um, uh, Go ahead, Jeff. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I... I love talking about this pitching set because yeah. it's such the bright spot of this team. And and the fact that it came in with the biggest question mark of the season, like mm-hmm. I think if you asked anybody before the season started, they're just like, boy, I don't know what we're going to get on a nightly basis from this, this pitching staff. And, and, and you even talk about Montas and, and, and 
Graham Ashcraft right now with their ERAs and the fours and stuff like that. I, I think that it's just because they've had some really inconsistent starts, but they have been really good at times too. And mm -hmm. if they can just tap into that a little bit more then it's, it's just all gold for the starting rotation. And I, I have been laughing the whole time. I'm glad that we got good news on Nicola Dolo because I always thought groin strain was just a weird way to pronounce load management. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's too good. I love it. Well, speaking of uh, <laughs> speaking of some injuries, you know that's been sort of the uh, the theme of the season so far. And I wanted to do a little quick dive into whether or not other teams are facing similar issues to the Reds. And the Reds kind of do seem to have it worse than the rest of the Central, at least. I didn't look at the rest of the league, but the Reds have had nine expected contributors spend time on the IL, ten counting Noel Marte, and. I don't know. Do we hear anything about Jake Fraley? X-ray is negative, which is a good thing. Okay, so he definitely has a broken arm. And we'll... Uh... <laughs> no, no, no. Or, well, no, no, I take it back. I was about to say that was Dodgers Doctors, but Dodgers Doctors looked at Emilio Pagan. That's what... Nah, yeah. <laughs> this yeah. might have been Pagan news. Yeah. The Cubs have had 10 players on the IL, but almost all those were relief pitchers, so definitely not the same impact as the Reds. Eight each for the Brewers and Pirates, and then seven people for the Cardinals. So the Reds have had worse injury luck than the rest of the division. Um, and then recently we heard some more about Matt McClain still eyeing an August return. And before we get into the topic of the week, let me throw this to you guys. We'll start with you, Branch. If the Reds are out of it, would you consider sitting Matt McClain for the rest of the season, assuming he's back Absolutely. healthy in mid-August? Absolutely, and I'm selling yeah, it, it, I, I'm sending him, him, and at the deadline we're selling. I mean, you're probably going to sell like Martinez, and you know any of the one year guys, they're gone. Uh, yeah, you know you're not going to be getting a lot out of them. Um, can I say one thing about Abbott? Um, Please. Before we, were talking, before we move on too much, he now I'm not confident him in the way he pitches or anything, but the attitude reminds me so much of Castillo when they make that jump from from Double A to the majors, and they don't hesitate. That's when you know that guy has the moxie. You know, he has what it takes to, to stand out there with the weight of the team on his shoulders and just take on the world. And all pitchers are crazy. They got to be able to do that. You know, because if they can, yeah. they, they can beat to death. You know, and that's what's really impressed me yeah. about Abbott is he just, ugh, he, when he's out there, he's a man. Mm. You know? Yeah, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. All right. Jeff, any thoughts on uh, what you would do with Matt McClain if he comes back, assuming the Reds are not in? Not even assuming in a hypothetical scenario that has no chance of being true, where the Reds are out of it by mid August. I certainly hope it's not true. Um, if they're if they're out of it, I definitely would slow play his return. Like I don't know, maybe if he comes back in mid September, give him a few at bats or something. But he is a guy that he does not he he knows only one speed. He knows full mm -hmm. speed. He does not does not play at half speed or anything like that. So you're not going to put him in and tell him to take it easy. Um, I think if they're out of it, you definitely have to consider the selling thing. And I think that Nick crawl has kind of built that into some of these contracts. Um, but I, I, I think I'd stop short of saying that I would just send him down the rest of the year, but I would definitely take the maximum amount of time in the rehab process. Yeah. I think that's where I am at the end of the day. All right, gentlemen, let's get on to the topic of the week here. And I'm pretty excited to do this. You know, we love a good draft, a good draft around the Red uh, Riverfront, the Riverfront, Riverfront Nation. We're merging, we're merging the two now. Um, what we're going to do this week is we're going to draft the greatest Reds trades of all time. And I am honored to be doing this with the two of you today. This is going to be a fun one. So this is a six round snake draft. We have six categories they are you must draft one trade pre-2000 one trade post-2000 one trade for an established player or players one trade for prospect or prospects one trade for a fan favorite and then one wild card where you can just draft whoever you want any questions there no questions all right. Well, let's see here. I'm going to put our names into a random list generator, and we are going to see what the draft order is. 
See, it did it again. It always puts me first. And I don't like that. Every time I click it, we're, we're going to keep going. All right, there we go. Branch, you have the first pick. All right. I have the second. And Jeff, you got the wrap around. So you'll be going going double. All right. So we can draft in any order you want. And I have a feeling I know who Branch is going to draft first. But uh, you may not. You may not. Uh, Let's see. Yeah. I, hope, I, I hope. I don't. I, I am. I am. The, I am the one person here that can remember it. I was alive <laughs> uh, when Rio got drafted, and 1990 would not have Ooh. happened without Jose Rio. Traded All for the right. I mean, that, okay. that to me, I was in tenth grade, and he's you know pitching game one and four of the 1990 World Series. It's a big trade to me. Mm-hmm. That's a big one. He is talking about, let's see, I've got some details on that down here. Let me find it. So that was the Reds got Jose Rijo and Tim Burtzis. They lost fan favorite Dave Parker. Mm-hmm. And that happened in 12, 8, December 8th, 1987. So that begs the question, Bruce, what category do you want this to be under? Pre-2000s. Pre-2000s. Got it. That's a solid choice. Well, thank you for that because then I, I, I'm allowed to get mine. And that's part right. of the strategy. You can have the best draft or you can have your favorite draft. You can take it any way you want it. I obviously am going to go pre-2000 also, but the trade that got Joe Morgan in Cincinnati from the Houston Astros. Yeah. The Reds get Morgan, Ed Armbrister, Jack Billingham, Cesar Toronto. So you could technically use this one again if you wanted to. Make Cesar the subject of it. And infielder Dennis Mink, Minky, I don't know. They gave up Tommy Helms, Lee May, and Jimmy Stewart, not the actor. And that was on November 29th, 1971. That was the trade that really set the big red machine on its path. And I am thrilled with the value of the number two pick right there. <laughs> Way they regard as one of the best trades ever. Ever, yeah. One is. of the best trades of all time. All right, Jeff, you That's got two in a row, buddy. Good because the Reds made like the worst trade of all time. I'm not drafting it, by the way. I'm not <laughs> drafting it. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're going to go pre 2000, and I'm going to go back because this is one of my favorite players to talk about. Did so a couple of different times on a Throwback Thursday podcast, uh, way back in the early days of the Locked On Reds podcast. But when the Reds made a trade with the New York Giants, July 20th, of 1916, and Ed Roush. Hall of Famer came on over to Cincinnati with with Christy Mathewson, who pitched one game as a Cincinnati Red, and Bill McKechnie, who uh, was not so much a player as he was a manager 20 years after this, um, for, and let's see if, I mean, I'm sure we all remember these guys, uh, Buck, Buck Herzog and Red Killifer. Um, oh, Red Killifer, so yes. one of my favorites. Yes, exactly. So that was a that was a tough one, but you know what? When you get back Ed Roush, the only guy to have ever been thrown out of a game for napping, it's it's <laughs> it's worth worth a deal. That's fantastic. Good pick. That one you went way back with that one. I don't have many from that far back on my on my list. But you have another one coming up. All right, let's um hmm, do I wanna do I wanna do this? Let's yeah, let's do a uh, trade post 2000 since a lot of these are depressing as heck. Um, let's do, <laughs> let's do the one that wasn't, let's do King Griffey Jr. The kid coming home. Absolutely love okay. that. Trade. And I get it. He wasn't as good as a red as he was as a Mariner, but I'd still do that trade every day of the week. Yeah, that was definitely a, a, a contender for a first round draft pick. Some details there from the Mariners. Res get King Griffey Jr. They give up Mike Cameron, Antonio Perez, Brett Tomko. Love me, love me some Brett Tomko. And Jake Meyer on February 10th, 2007. And I would like to thank just about every Reds fan who can uh, who has legitimate memories from that time remembers getting that news. Yep. Can you imagine Twitter I, um, today? Oh, it, it, it would break. And especially with the way that Red's Twitter loves to run. Who knows exactly how many people would love it and hate it. Um, 
but that was. I can't believe you gave up Brett Tomko. He's an elite prospect. <laughs> Antonio Perez is such high high hopes on his his prospect. Yeah, no. Although I did have I had a great Brett Tomko Reds Fest experience one time. He was going in between a photo booth and an autograph booth. And I was like, Brett Tomko. And he's like, you recognize me just walking around? And I'm like, yeah, you're awesome, dude. And he took a selfie with me just randomly. So that was that was a lot of fun. He's a really nice guy. <laughs> that is a lot of fun. I love it. All right. So now it is my turn. And I got to figure out where to go with this. You know, I'm going to go post 2000 also because I don't, I think it's a pretty weak category. And I want to go with something that happened on January 19th, 2017, when the Reds got one Luis Castillo it is. Yeah. from the Marlins mm-hmm. for Dan Straley, Austin Bryce, and Isaiah White. Um, there is a strong argument that he uh, is the greatest pitcher, greatest Reds pitcher of all time. I'm not saying I believe it, but you can argue it. Mm-hmm. And I sorely, sorely miss that guy. There's a scenario if we do this draft again in five years that uh, when he leaves the Reds could be included somewhere on this. But right now, I do not feel that way. Any I think thoughts that, on that, Brent? Fu- go ahead, oh, Jeff. Sorry, Brent. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, was, I was just gonna. I was gonna say because like I thought I was bad luck at that time because I got Dan Straley's autograph at Reds Fest two weeks before this. And I'm like, no, I get an autograph and it gets traded. No, come on. <laughs> so actually Where's you were the catalyst. So you're, you're incredible luck. I was the catalyst. Yeah. <laughs> I need you to go get some more, more autographs, buddy. <laughs> All right, Branch, you've got two in a row. Okay. Well, we're going to go first and then just 2000. Cause yeah, there's not a ton to choose from there. Uh, We'll go with uh, Aurora, Willie Mo Pena. Ooh. Um, he was yeah. uh, he, he was a stable, and he was my kids' favorite pitchers. So, you know, that, that when they were growing up and they were little, that was, trust me, I have a son that threw from every arm angle possible because he watched Aurora. <laughs> you know, it was frustrating trying to get him to pitch right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, yeah that, that, that's going to be my 2000s. That is a fantastic pick. So we're going to go post 2000 Arroyo. I had him listed under fan favorite, under yeah. established veteran. That would fit a lot of categories for us. And um, as much as I had high hopes for Willie Mopania when he first became a red buddy, that trade worked out. All right. You got another one, Branch. Oh, I'm going to go fan favorite and go Brandon Phillips. Ooh. Okay. Be, uh, I like it. I mean, it- he might not be the fan favorite on this podcast necessarily, but oh yeah, anymore, <laughs> anymore, anymore. But at one time, <laughs> he certainly was for a long time. That was a good one too. That also could have fit a couple different slots. I'm going to pull it up here. So the Reds from the Indians got flame out prospect Brandon Phillips, former top prospect who had not done a darn thing. They gave up. Jeff Stevens to get him. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I don't remember the Jeff Stevens era at all. (laughs) That happened on April 7th, 2006, and he was good for the Reds kind of right away. Some of the best defense you've ever seen from the second base position. A huge, huge piece. Some would argue the heart and soul of that. The last really good span of Reds teams we had. My God, that was a long time ago. Come on. Get it together, guys. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that is a uh, that's a darn good pick. All right, so let me see here. I've got my pre two thousands. I got my post two thousands. Let's move on down the line, and I'm going to go for a trade for an established player. And this one I was unsure of at the time, but I couldn't be happier with how it turned out. Aside from maybe one defensive miscue. But the Reds on July 31st, 2009, traded for Scott Rowland. This was a tough one. They got it from the Blue Jays for Edwin Encarnacion, who ended up being quite the ball player, Josh Roenick, and Zach Stewart. But he held down the corner, was a veteran presence that team sorely needed, kind of like this team sorely needs. And, um, you know, Hall of Famer. 
Yeah, I always think that that's not that's not a trade that you know, so many trades you'd be like, man, what happened if they didn't do that? But I never think about that because I mean, let's be honest. Edwin Encarnacion had the nickname of E5 with the Reds. Like, I don't think <laughs> yeah. you're coming back from that. Like, yeah. just kind of is what it, it is. It needed to be. Point. The NL did not have the DH at that time. <laughs> so, Toronto was good. He was brain. not good defensively. <laughs> All right. Of the Jeff, Scott Rowland have... trade, too, is like, man, one one error that Scott Rowland made kind of kind of messes that whole thing up, realizing that the guy they traded him for committed about 700 different <laughs> errors. <laughs> hey. All right, I got a question. So, uh, sure. Does 54 games make a veteran? <laughs> <laughs> I would see, I would Probably. argue no, just because <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna argue that the Jose Rijo trade could have been for a prospect because he'd only had a couple a couple years under his belt at that point. So I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to say no on this. But we're pretty loose with the rules around here. I mean, if you want to make it, <laughs> I'm trying to think. All right, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna say um, trade for. A young player, and I got to pull this up because I did not realize I was doing some research before this. You, you'll be impressed. I actually studied. I studied more for this than I did for any test in college. Um, <laughs> I'm going back again, not not as far back this time, but I'm going back. 1932, in the Brooklyn Dodgers, send Ernie mm-hmm. Lombardi to Cincinnati yeah. with Wally Gilbert and Babe Herman. Uh, for Tony Cuccinello, Joe Strip, and Clyde Sukaforth, which I know that we all really missed out on the Joe Strip experience, but um, at the end of the day, I think her end of the party was definitely worth it. I definitely had this one on my list. This was a, a deep cut and well done. I'm glad that you were the one that had to pronounce Sukaforth out loud because I, I was going to, I was going to, I was going <laughs> to butcher that. Oh, Clyde Sukaforth. So um, <laughs> yeah, not often you trade for a Hall of Famer like that. And I was reading about that, that trade, and apparently, the reason, one of the reasons they were so willing to give him up, is because he wasn't pitching very well. I mean, those are strange times when your <laughs> Hall of Fame catcher gets traded to you because he wasn't pitching too well. I love that's a great pick. All right, you got another one. All right, this is gonna be the tough. I, all right, I'm just I, I got to do some more some more looking for established players. So we're going to go fan favorite Dave Burba for Sean Casey. Give me that one. Ooh, interesting. Cause they traded uh, I, a bigger fan favorite. The mayor to me just, I mean, he's probably, yeah. if it's, if it's not for Joseph Daniel, I think uh, Sean Casey's still probably my most favorite red ever. And, this this trade and you're right. It's funny. Like Dave Burbo, <laughs> he was a pretty. I love good Dave Burbo. I love Dave yeah, Burbo. Pretty good. So it's not like they gave up nothing for something on this one. But I just I love Sean Casey so much. I want that. I want that on my draft. That is a fantastic pick. A strong argument that he's the most beloved red of all time. Um, yeah, just heck of a guy. Heck of a red. Great player. I loved it. All right. I'm up next. I got a quick one. I'm going to go for prospect slash young guy. And how about the time on May 29th, 1971, when from the Giants, the Reds got a guy named George Foster. A once heralded prospect who uh, had not been playing too hot and fallen out of favor out of the starting lineup for the Giants. They gave up Frank Duffy and Vern Geishert to get George Foster turns into a hall of famer and a uh, integral part of the big red machine. And he also got drafted first round in the all sideburns draft that we did <laughs> off air. All right. Definitely worth back to you branch. All right. I'm going to go major leaguer this time. Uh, I'm going to go Tom Seaver, the midnight massacre. Ooh. Very nice. I wondered if this was going to get get drafted. Yeah, that, was, that one has to get there. Well, they gave up yeah, uh, Pat see. Zachary, Doug Flynn, and Steve Henderson, and Dan Norman. Now for Dan Norman, yeah, yeah that, that was a that was that was a trade. How dare you forget Dan Norman? 
Damn, man. Yeah, that was uh, pretty incredible. That was on June 15th, 1977, my birthday, eight years before I was oh. born. Um, the Mets stunk for a long time after that. The uh, the Mets, one of the best trade nicknames of all time, too, the Midnight Massacre. I love it. Mm-hmm. All right, that's, I'm going to write that down. That was a fantastic pick. And you have another one, sir. Okay, where we at here? Let me see. So usually let's do a quick rundown. Yeah. You've got pre and post. You've got vet. So you still need a trade for prospects and a wild card. Trade for prospects. Well, I'm going to go with a recent one because I'm kind of liking the guys. Is uh, we're going to go uh, uh, Molly. We got the. Uh, I really like CES and uh, and uh, Mr. Steer. Yeah, I had a feeling. If we can count them as prospects. I think we can, can't we? Steered Absolutely. Prospect? 100%. Neither one has been called up yet. Yeah. 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 I had a feeling this was going to get picked. That was on uh, August 2nd, 2022. The Reds traded Tyler Malley oh. for Christian Encarnacion Strand, Spencer Steer, and Stephen Hajar, who later became oh. Will Benson. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you could argue that just based on how much we love these guys today, this, this pick could have gotten earlier. So very good value on that one and heck of a return. We hope that it pans out. All right. Good pick branch back to me. I still have wild card and fan favorite to go. Um, I'm going to draft from my heart right here. And for, Fan favorite. I'm going with Yaziel Puig, baby. On December 21st, 2018, the Reds get Puig, Matt Kemp, Alex Wood, and Kyle Farmer for Homer, Bailey, Jeter, Downs, and Josiah Gray. And I don't care about the stats. I don't care about the shenanigans. All I care about is the dude trying to fight the entire Pittsburgh Pirates (laughs) team by himself. And now I have that guy on my team, and y'all don't. So if there's any beef <laughs> between our draft picks, I'm just saying, I've got Yassi up with <laughs> Hmm. Then I probably got to draft a dude that's gonna gonna be a good, good, uh, good dude to have if there is beef between our two teams. And I'm gonna go with Greg Vaughn. I know he was only here for one Ooh, year, but yeah. that 1999 team is what – I mean, I, I've always been a Reds fan, but that 1999 team is what sucked me in and probably will never let me go. And Greg Vaughn is a huge reason for that. That's pretty they fair. Traded, you can't – Let's see. Josh Harris, Damian Jackson, and Reggie Sanders. And they got Mark Sweeney. Yeah. They also got Mark Sweeney on. Yeah. Don't forget Mark Sweeney. No, that's a that's a that's a great pick. He um so I don't know if you got a chance to listen to any of our Red Lake Roundtable series with Seth Shaner. He's been interviewing a lot of these guys from the 1999 team, and they seem to be universal in praising Greg Vaughn for bringing that mentality to the locker room. That kind of seems like this squad doesn't have right now. So, all right, I want to draft Greg Vaughn just to come join the 2024 Reds. All right, so, uh, yeah, right. Jeff, your last pick coming up, and that is for a prospect. For a prospect, I think. Or prospects. We have drafted everything on my list, so I'm glad it's you, not me. (laughs) (laughs) We're missing one, I think, aren't we? Thing. We're probably missing a couple. See, this is why I'm very bad at uh, Immaculate Grid because I get to the last spot and I'm like, I know there's somebody. Um, hmm. Let's go. Shoot. Prospect. I'm happy to let you come back to it since it is not a competitor for my final round let's do it <laughs> let's come back to <laughs> we're, on, we're not on any clock here and we're ahead of schedule so we're good all right so my last category is wild card and this may end up being a little controversial but we'll see i am here for the baseball hate the artist not the art 
How about a trade in August of 1984 when Pete Rose returns to the Reds Mm -hmm. and goes on to break the all-time hits record? We do not advocate for Pete Rose the human, but we appreciate Pete Rose the ball player. Ten-year-old Branch was very excited about that trade. I was really excited about that trade. That, so was my whole yeah. family. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. In a season where there wasn't much to be excited about. Like you wouldn't believe when, when he broke the record, the whole family gathered around TV every single night. It was it was mm-hmm. what we did. And you know, I was young, so yeah. it was just like cool, you know. Gosh, if you know, if I had a time machine, I'd go back and I'd buy a bunch of real yeah. estate in the two thousand eight crash and then I'd go back back a little bit further and watch <laughs> yeah. <Pete> Rose. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Branch, you have one more pick. Yours is also wild card. You can do whatever you want with this one. I'm trying to think, y'all didn't say this one, and I can't believe it. I don't believe anybody said it. Well, they traded out the bloated corpse of Alfredo Simon for AUA and <laughs> Oh, duh, That's a good prospect. I mean, that's uh, we got to we got to go out and shout out to Chad for that one, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was I was waiting on you to do it. I was hoping. Yeah, I was I was worried. I was like, oh man, that was gonna. Gonna miss it. I'm like, they so hard to say it because it's Gino. He made he made some of them awful years watchable. <laughs> you know, I'm look, I'm looking at some of these fan favorite picks, and uh, I wish I'd have grabbed it sooner. That's a heck of a pick, Gino. Another one similar to Sean Casey of the most beloved Reds yeah. of all time. Yeah. Good vibes only. Oh man, great final pick, Branch. All right, we can round out this bad boy with brother Jeff. Did you find your prospect? Um, shoot. Let's do, do we want to choose violence? Cody Reed. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Don't, how dare you? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> You're fired. Branch is gone. This is <laughs> true. <laughs> do that around the horn thing when they meet them. Um, <laughs> um Let this be a lesson that there have been so many good trades for prospects that panned out in Reds history that one of the most knowledgeable Reds fans on the planet is having a hard time choosing. Keep that in the back of your mind, Um, Reds fans. Let's go with just because just because it's funny and this is stuck in my mind. I don't know why it's stuck in my mind, but there's a former announcer and he'll remain nameless that always pronounced this guy's name wrong. And it was hilarious, but he leaned into it. So whenever the reds traded for Dilson Herrera, we're going to pick. That one. <laughs> I don't know why that's just in my mind. <laughs> that's a good one. Wasn't that Jay Bruce? That I was a Jay it. Bruce trade, wasn't it? Yeah. It was Jay yeah. Bruce trade. yeah. I love that this one also could All have been fan trades. favorite <laughs> because for some reason we love us and Dilson Herrera too. All those trades, man. Those oh that was that was three years of just awful trades. What about the rookie Davis trade? We could go with that one. And, mm. you know. That's fantastic. Branch, so Branch, Branch start, Cody Reed. I have been writing these down. I don't know if y'all have um I can read I can read through them. It's just a quick recap of what everybody got. All right, so Branch, for pre-2000, drafted Jose Rijo. Post-2000, Bronson Arroyo. Great trade. I really wanted that one. Jealous. Fan favorite, Brandon Phillips. Veteran presence, Tom Seaver. Prospects, the Tyler Malley trade, which led to CES, Spencer Steer, and eventually Will Benson. And for wild card, Gino Suarez. That's a, that's a good draft. Looking at it, it's a good draft. All right, I had... Pre-2000, Joe Morgan, arguably the greatest trade of all time. Feeling solid. It's the best, it's yeah. the best trade of, of the Reds ever. You know. Of the Reds, yeah. yeah. Um, post-2000, Luis Castillo, veteran presence, Scott Rowland, prospect, George Foster, wild card, Pete Rose, and fan favorite, Yaziel Puig. And then brother Jeff, pre-2000, deep cut, Ed Roush, post-2000, the junior trade, which is probably the most exciting trade of my lifetime. Um, veteran presence, early Ernie Lombardi, probably like the sneaky, sneaky best pick of the draft, most underrated pick. 
And then fan favorite Sean Casey prospect, <laughs> Dilson Herrera. And wild card, Greg Vaughn. Yeah, yeah. Guys, I think we did a pretty darn good job. Um, I want to throw out a couple that we might have missed, just as a little honorable mention. Uh, Pre-2000, the Heine Grow trade. So 1913, Res Get Grow, Red Ames, Josh DeVore, and 20K for Art From. Um, Post-2000 category, Res Get Sonny Gray from the Yankees, along with Reaver San Martin for Shed Long and a 2019 competitive balance pick. That was a good trade. That was a really good trade. Who did that one? We should we should have that guy as the GM. <laughs> uh, fan favorite, the Reds got Aaron Harang for Jose Guillen. Um, Eddie Taubensy, Eddie Taubensy for uh, Ross Powell and Marty Lister is on my list. Dimitri Young was traded for, um, actually this was a fun one. The, Ray, the Tampa Bay Rays got Mike Kelly and Dimitri Young was actually the player to be named later in that trade. They traded Mike Kelly for just somebody down the road, and they got meat hook out of it. Love so love that. And then uh, Corky Miller, <laughs> fan favorite, wild card, whatever category you want. The Reds got Corky in 2009. Got rid of Norris Hopper, though, so sayonara. Any other trades that you, uh, you guys had on your list that didn't make it? I would say, nice. and it's only because it, it's only because of the way it made me feel as much as I hated mm -hmm. it, and it's a trade that made me realize that I love talking about baseball, and it's when the Reds traded Felipe Lopez and Austin mm -hmm. Cardins to the Washington yeah. Nationals for nothing, nothing, and Bill Bray. Um, yeah. I I firmly remember how I felt that day, like thinking even then I was like this seems like a bad trade and I was not doing daily analysis about the Reds back then, but it was like the moment when I realized, Hey, I kind of like talking about this baseball thing. This is kind of fun. Even though it's because the Reds did something dumb. Little did I know that wasn't going to be the first. That's when a bad trade last. becomes yeah. something beautiful. Yeah. I was, I was surprised. <laughs> Latos was the trade. In there. Oh, yeah. was Latos was, he was on my board. He was, was on my board as were yeah. Another guy that we uh, don't root for, but the Trevor Bauer trade in a in a vacuum, in a baseball only vacuum, worked out on the diamond was a disaster off the diamond. Yeah. We won't get into that. Did the Reds, and then, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. One more because I got a question about one of the trades we just mentioned. I was just going to say the uh, one that I had flagged for a wild card just in case I needed it is that the Reds traded Tyler Naquin for. Hector Rodriguez and Jose Acuna, and I am so high on Hector Rodriguez that I was prepared to draft this good, if I Dayton. needed to. It looks good, Dayton. Um, right, what were you going to say before I so rudely interrupted you? No, I, I, I was just thinking out loud a little bit on this one. Did the Reds win the Matt Latos trade? I don't know who won that trade. I was thinking because of that trade. Grandal, mm -hmm. Boxberger, yeah, they, all have had some pretty decent careers. Um, not, not really um, – um, you know, I'm going to say yes. They're a parent to Joe. Just Bobby. because, <laughs> yeah. Just because of how much fun that little four-year window was for Reds fans. That was fun. And, they, and and he when 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 Cueto went down and he stepped in, that was that was huge. Yeah, I mean, it, he was a co co ace on that team. A, co a couple days later, it went drastically different. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's a good call. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. Well, I think that's going to do it for the all-time red trade draft. It seems like I should uh, get you guys back on in a month or so, and we'll do the all-time worst red trade draft because that's going to be a lot easier to. It might, it might be easier. <laughs> <laughs> a lot easier to go through. Shout out Dude. Frank Robinson. There's the one. Might need two post two thousands yeah. categories. <laughs> <laughs> it's an only post two thousands. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, so we do have um one viewer mail question this week, guys, and this is a good one to end on, also. But before we get to that, shout out to a new member, Dave Magrum, which is the newest member of the Patreon family. Welcome, Dave. We are pumped to have you, and. As y'all probably know, every time we get a new member, we add them to the beer league softball team and we give them a position. And I got to tell you, 
you can go anywhere with a name like Dave Magrum. And I'm excited to see where this goes. So, Branch, as a member of the Beer League softball team, where do you think Dave should play? Well, he's behind the plate. Dave Magrum is behind the plate, and he is – he, he he runs the whole team. He's got yeah. beer back there. He takes chugs in between batters. He's he sitting tells on the cooler. Where to sit. He tells everyone to back up or come forward. He moves people over for righties and lefties. He runs the whole team. Uh, he, he's yeah. a hell of a catcher on softball team. Really is. Old school catcher mask or hockey totally. catcher mask? No, old school. Old school with the soft hat. Yeah. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't wear the hard hat. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Couldn't agree more. Dave is the reason that they had to institute that you can only hit like two home runs per inning in softball <laughs> rule because all he does is mash. He's breaking all the records. McGuire and Sosa ain't got nothing on Dave. All right, let's round this out with a question from Robbie Wilson. Cousin Robbie, I love it. The Riverfront family is getting bigger and including members of the actual, my actual family. Love it. Robbie, glad to have you. He says, don't get me wrong. This stretch has been zero fun, but the Reds are still only three and a half games back of a wild card spot. So how bad could it be? Braces for impact. <laughs> Although I don't see another 12 game win streak in the near future, I do think this team can turn it around and get back to being fun again. Do you agree? I will throw out this is being recorded on Wednesday night. We had to record a day early. So those numbers were true when Robbie posted that. Not sure what they're going to be when this drops. So let's go around the table here. Branch, start with you. Do you think the Reds are out of it? Do you have hope? How are you feeling about the situation right now? Can they get back in it? I was feeling so good after last night, but they're down seven to one right now. Oh, no. <laughs> I, knew, I knew we should have answered this question earlier. <laughs> About those peaks and valleys, Nick. Uh, oh, <laughs> a lot of peaks and valleys. Uh, I think I think they will. I think they're going to. The schedule's getting easier, so it's going to appear there might be some smoke of beers. It's they're going to make a run in June, and right before the all all star break, we're probably going to be like. Man, they're only like five games back of the division. Uh, you know, they're right there, like one game back. And so we're going to get all our hopes up for the All Star break. And then if the Reds ever come back from an All Star break and go on a winning streak, you know, then that'll be news to me. Uh, so they never do. We'll see how it goes. Um, the schedule is good in June and July. It really is. So yeah. they could claw their way back into it. And they have, they have been playing some amazingly good. They've been playing some amazingly good teams. And also playing inside the division changes things a bunch. So, so they true. could. It doesn't the, the, I'm gonna say yes because the pitching, pitching is everything. No. And if the pitching holds, then they will beat these other teams. Ending this on a high note. I love it. Jeff, what do you think? I 100 percent agree. And I it's the thing that everybody hates to hear, but it's the darn truth with this team is that. They have just had the worst luck with injuries. It, like so many guys, guys are missing matter. from this lineup. Guys that yeah, really, really yeah. matter. Your leadoff hitter and center fielder, your second baseman and arguable team captain, your, uh, you know, your first baseman of the future guy that you know we felt comfortable with putting in the middle of the order, and some argued could have been the best hitter, at least coming into opening day. Some people were saying CES could be the best hitter on this team. All these guys are out of the lineup right now, and you're replacing them with guys like Nick Martini and Mike Ford and Stuart Fairchild and Santiago Espinal and a whole bunch of guys that are fine and tiny sample sizes, and you don't have to see them very much, but we are having to see them every day, and it's driving us all crazy. So I think that eventually we're <laughs> going to get healthy we're going to see that lineup on the field that we expect to see on the field and this pitching staff will be continuing to do some good things i mean today notwithstanding but it's nick martinez is a starter nick martinez is a starter is like completely different than nick martinez as a reliever yeah. i don't know why that's, that's lodolo's spot yes yeah. and it's Lodolo's spot. <laughs> yeah so yeah he he's going to be back soon from his load yeah. ma- groin strain uh, and I really think that this team is going to take off. It's the summer. The summer is going to be a lot of fun. I just really hope that they don't continue to dig the hole any deeper than it's already gotten. It's yeah. already kind of deep, but I, I feel good about it. I feel good about it. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, they need they need to tread water and just make up a tiny bit of ground heading into uh, the All Star break. 
know, that Nick Martinez spot's not great, not where he needs to be. It is the Lodolo spot. It can also be filled by Brandon Williamson before long, who we feel a lot better about than Nick Martinez in that starting role. So, Robbie, I think we all agree. We don't need a 12-game winning streak. They could do two six-gamers, three four-gamers. At this point, I will take six two-gamers because we're not getting the two-gamers either. Um, it's not over yet. We got to be realistic about this. It's ugly and it's bleak, but it is not over. It is the end of May. Um, a graphic went out on Twitter today that was like, when was the uh, last time a team won the World Series when a team has the record your favorite team currently does? And the last team, this is as of Wednesday, pregame, when a team won the World Series with the same record as the Reds right now. It was only 2018. 19, sorry, the Washington Nationals. So uh, there's we, we, we can squint. I mean, they got even we worse. We can find that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Got even worse. All right. Some optimism there. That's a good way to end it. Guys, uh, thank you so, so much for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Can't wait to do the worst trades draft. Maybe save that for the offseason. Unless the Reds are playing real well, we can handle that kind of negativity. <laughs> I don't think we can give it out right now. Branch, uh, First off, it's an honor to have you on here for the first time. I loved it. Uh, tell people where they can Thank find you. you. So Thank you so much. You can find me at uh, on Twitter at West Virginia Red Meat. It's WV Red Meat. It's pretty simple. Or, you know, West Virginia Red Legs, I think I pop up too. But one I, of really the, appreciate, uh, I really appreciate you having me on. Really do. Branch is one of the absolute best Twitter follows out there. So do, do yourselves a favor. Go check it out. I'll try to remember to put his uh, uh, Twitter handle in the show notes. Jeff, how about you? Can people find you anywhere? Are you even online? I'm around a couple <laughs> places. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Jeff Carr with three F's. I do have a TikTok. I try to do stuff instead of just watching TikToks. I try to post every so often on there. And it's at Jeff Carr with three F's. And you can follow the show for Lockdown Reds wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and Branch, it's great being with you. Nate, great being with you. Uh, Branch, I appreciate a tweet you had yesterday. You had a tweet. You're just like, I really hate talking about next year in May. And yeah. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> right there. Right, yep, right there with you. Oh, oh, it hurts. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Um, guys, if you have a chance, go out there, check out everything else that's going on around the riverfront. Uh, I mentioned Red Lake Roundtable with Seth Shaner. He had Scott Sullivan on for this week's episode. A fantastic interview with Scott, largely talking about that 1999 team. Uh, Tim Daniel and Ben Brown over at Late Night Reds having the most fun. They've got a live yeah. show coming out along with host of Welcome to the Jungle, Joe Farsing, Joe's counterpart, Parker Fields. They've got Bill Lack on this week. After dropping a few F-bombs last week, Bill decided he would go over to the uh, the Bengals show, Welcome to the Jungle, where it's a little safer and he can speak freely. Um, we also have a cool NBA show, NBA Happy Hour with Tim Parker and Sean Mackey that is uh, picking up a lot of steam over there. So lots to check out on the Riverfront. Head over to our YouTube page. Like things, subscribe to things, follow things. We appreciate you. Shout out to Dave Magrum. Shout out to the Patreon family. We love you guys. Couldn't do it without you. And shout out to Adam Dunn. Shout out to Lisa Alberto. Shouts to Wayne Cranchicki and Eli Cash. And shouts to Corky Miller. For Branch Brown and Jeff Carr, this is Nate Dotson saying so long, Cincinnati.